Hello and welcome back to the second half of my lecture on John Locke. What? You, you can't see me? Nope. <laughs> I forgot I had on my, my invisibility cloak there for a minute. Alright, so at this point we enter into the late stages of the state of nature. In Locke's theory, since human beings are rational and moral, their interactions, we have to imagine, would be much more civil than they would have been in Hobbes' form of the state of nature. And human beings will, in fact, be able to develop some culture as they move around throughout the state of nature. Maybe they would even, at some point, develop money, coins. Now, why is this important? Well, this is a cultural revolution, according to Locke. Because money has a property that none of the goods have in the state of nature. You remember that all the apples rotted. You can only take care of so many chickens, right? But money is non-perishable. And all you have to do to take care of it is put it in a pile someplace. So money allows for accumulation that was not possible before it was created. Money is non-perishable, and so it will allow us to keep goods across seasons and build up more and more goods. Now, you might recognize that this will aggravate a position that we had in the beginning, because we recognize that everybody has slightly different powers. Some people have advanced abilities above others on the basis of their nature. That guy who's tall can pull down the apples. Well, what happens now if that one guy pulls down the apples and he plants the apple seeds from his first year, and so he develops an apple orchard? Well, the girl next to him does the same thing, but inevitably the next year his apple orchard is larger than hers. Now this goes on for a couple of years, and every year he pulls down a few more apples than she does, and his orchard continues to get larger. As he builds up more and more money at the end of each season. Now, one year there's a bad season, so only half of the apples produce, but he's got enough plants that he's able to make it okay, whereas she doesn't have enough apples by the times they're halved to actually make it out of the season okay. What's gonna happen at the end of this season? Well, she's going to be in need, and he's going to have extra money left over. So she comes to him and says, well, hey, I need to have some of that money in order to get the seed and the fertilizer and everything to keep my crops going. Well, he might say, okay, here's the deal. What we'll do is you can sell me your orchard. And then I'll allow you to work on the orchard, and then you get, say, 70 cents out of every dollar that I make on the apples that come from your orchard. So now we've got the situation where he becomes an owner of what she had, and now she is his employee, right? Which means that every season it's guaranteed that he will make more than she makes, even if they're putting in an equal amount of labor because they have different natural qualities. Now, this inevitably is going to give rise to greater and greater inequality in the system. You can imagine that as he goes, he might end up buying multiple different orchards or spreading out into multiple different products and starting like Bausch and Lomb or, or Kellogg's or one of those co companies that takes over everything. You have like a little monopoly over the apples in the area. So what are we supposed to do about this? Well, again, Locke gives us very little solution to this other than saying, well, he can only take as much as he can uh, so long as there's as good as much for everybody else. So Locke imagines a scenario where Sure, he can offer to buy her orchard, but if she can't do that, she can always go down and just start with another tree, start off on her own again, pull herself up by her bootstraps, and get herself going. Well, 
we've noted that that's not always realistic. I mean, it might be that she has to travel a great ways, maybe too far to find another tree. And eventually it might be that there's just no trees available. But in any case, this doesn't seem to be a concern of Locke's. Because, as he stated, he has his rights, his natural rights for people. And those are natural rights that individuals have. Their right to their life, their right to their liberty, and their right to their property. And he conceived of all of these as negative rights. They're rights that protect me from other people getting in my way. They're not positive rights. It doesn't mean that you owe me food in order to keep my life going. The right to life means you can't take my life. It doesn't mean you have to provide me with goods for life. So having rights that separate us all, but nothing that actually binds us to, us to each other, no duties to each other, as we might have in society, no one's under any obligation to help each other. And inequality just doesn't register as a moral problem for Locke. At this point, we need to register a significant shift that's happening in relation to morality and property and how we think about goods and people. You'll remember that we started off with Plato, who was suspicious of material goods and thought that they led us away from higher goods and pointed us towards menial goods in the world so that his guardians didn't even have ownership of material goods. And you'll remember that Aristotle suggested that people are only justified in gathering up material goods to the extent that those material goods are necessary to the human practices that they work out. So I can gather together goods in order to fulfill my practice as a father, in order to fulfill my practice as a member of the Aristos who needs to gain experience in a whole set of different areas. But gaining anything beyond what we need, he thought, was in fact a form of unnatural accumulation. It was a form that would distort our minds and lead us to vice. And Augustine, as much as he wanted to admit that all things in the world are good in their own sense, surely pizza is a good, he also recognized that all things should be valued in relation to God, and that there's a hierarchy of different values where material goods still fall fairly low in the system. So he didn't want you to get tempted by material goods because they might turn your will away from God and towards them. But by the time we get to modernity, we have a shift here, where as a matter of fact, the pursuit of goods becomes a virtue unto itself. Here, not from Locke, but from Ben Franklin, we find an articulation of what he calls the virtue of industry. Lose no time. Be always employed in something useful. Cut off all unnecessary actions. There at the bottom, there's another bit of wisdom. Hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. The idea is, if you put in your labor, you'll be able to come out ahead. You'll be able to gain acquisitions. And so, it suggests that the more money, the more goods that you have, the more virtuous you are. As a matter of fact, if you claim more than is necessary, if you build up an empire of wealth behind you, well, in modernity, we might think, hey, that person must be really good at least in a particular set of virtues. This moral shift also has an ugly underside, where if someone doesn't have goods, it's possible to think, well, that must be because they're not a good person, because they have not engaged their virtue and gone out and worked hard. You see, in the ancient world, there was an emphasis on that natural inequality that shaped different people. And so, in a society, and created a situation which was, in theory, the best for everybody, no matter what their situation was. But in modernity, we tend to stop paying attention to our natural differences in power and focus on whether we've put in the work. It's typical of modern humanity that since we've advanced in science, we think of ourselves as conquering the world and no longer dependent upon fate or upon nature, thinking that we can, in fact, create ourselves. 
which is an interesting position. I think the classical thinkers had some fairly good arguments against. Now, I mentioned before that there might be some problems with the way the state of nature is set up, especially in that we are judges over our own cases and we are executors of our own judgments. So at that point, you might think, okay, I mean, what if everybody does have access to the natural law so they know what's moral, but yet if your cow wanders over into my property, right, my land that I've worked on and set aside, is that cow now my property or is it still your property? How do we sort that out? That seems an ambiguous case to me, right? So how should we make a judgment? Well, Locke recognizes that while people have access to the natural law and are rational, they also are probably biased a little bit in their own favor. Even though he thinks we're a tabula rasa, there's still a bit of Hobbes and Machiavelli hanging around in here. So he recognizes that we will probably make judgments that are in our own favor rather than in the favor of everybody else. And this isn't actually ideal. This is one of the inconveniences of the state of nature, says Locke. Think about that as opposed to Hobbes. I mean, Hobbes, everybody's killing each other and chopping off each other's heads and taking property, whereas Locke's state of nature is just inconvenient in some ways. So that's one of the inconveniences of nature. Also, since we are the executors of our own judgments, we might take more than an eye for an eye, and we might not be able to see that because we are biased in our own favor. But you know that none of this is enough to actually tip the scales in the direction of social development until we get to the development of inequality. And you might think, oh, good, Locke is finally going to come back and say something about inequality and how we should address that. Well, no, that's not what Locke thinks is the problem. He thinks that with the development of greater inequality that comes along with money, there will be a threat to one of our natural rights. We don't have a natural right to equality, but we do have a natural right to our property. And as inequality grows, there's going to be a tendency amongst those who have lost out in the game so far to think more and more because of their own bias that they might be justified in coming up and taking away the property of those who have advanced. Well, Locke says we can't have this happening because that would be a violation of our right to property. So it's at this point that we should say, okay, you know what, the inconveniences of the state of nature are getting to be inconvenient enough that we ought to look towards a social contract. Now, it's interesting to think, like, who are the we in this scenario? Is it everybody? Is it actually the majority? Or is it the people who have made the most money, the bourgeois members of society, who would actually be most interested in this social contract? Well, Locke doesn't mention it, although we might suspect that it's actually the bourgeois and not the majority of the society that would be into this, because in the state of nature, they wouldn't have had as many problems equaling things out Robin Hood style. But getting back to the main point, it is here that Locke says we would create a society, a social contract. The reasoning is not exactly the same as Hobbes. If you recall, Hobbes said we're all selfish people, and so we do selfish negotiations. We give rise to our fear, and that enacts our reason, and our reason is able to calculate out how we will get into society. Locke says that our interests are actually more universal here, not as selfish, because what we get into political society in order to do is to protect natural rights. Now, those happen to be our natural rights, of course, but, I mean, they are natural rights in general that we're trying to protect. The social contract does not create morality for Locke, and unlike for Hobbes, we don't surrender some of our rights when we come into the social contract in order to create a system of morality. Morality already existed in the state of nature. So when we make the social contract, we do so in order to establish a framework that will uphold the natural rights that we already have in a state of nature. So the state is created to protect our rights. Here we can see that in Hobbes and Locke, there's an overlap. 
Aristotle, Plato, they tended to think that people owed to the society, whereas in modern thought, we think that the society is created to protect the rights of individuals or to serve the selfish interest of individuals. So Locke says, here's what government is to do. Government is to protect our life, our liberty, and our property. And that's really all that it's supposed to do. It shouldn't go beyond that. So if the state is only justified in protecting our life, liberty, and property, what are we supposed to make of the state, say, taxing people? Because that seems to be taking away their property, right? But uh, Locke does recognize that in order to have a state, you're going to have to have some form of taxation because the state has to be run. You have to have people in it. If you're going to have police to protect your rights, you're at least going to have to have taxes to pay the police and then the judges and then maybe the legislators and other things like that. Well, Locke's answer to this is that it doesn't violate my right to property if I choose to hand it over to the government. Because, again, we're individuals. I can enter into contractual relationships, and we can have exchanges with other people as long as that is governed by our own wills. So the trick is, I have to agree to taxation. Well, how can that happen? Locke writes, Governments cannot be supported without great charge, and it is fit everyone who enjoys his share of the protection should pay out of his estate his proportion for the maintenance of it. But still, it must be with his own consent, as in the consent of the majority, giving it either by themselves or their representatives chosen by them. So Locke concludes that taxation is okay as long as it's linked with representation. No taxation without representation. Now, note, this doesn't mean that every individual actually has to agree with it, and it doesn't even mean that every representative of the society in government needs to agree with it. Simply, the majority is enough to establish the will. And in some sense, Locke is still going with an idea of the sovereign here. The government is, in some sense, the embodiment of the will of all of the people. So if the representatives of the people in the legislature make a rule that there will be a tax for this, the majority of them agree to it, then that stands in as our agreement that we're willing to pay those taxes. Of course, the members of the legislature have their own limitations because they can't just tax us for anything that they want to, at least they aren't justified in doing that. They are only allowed to tax us if it's in service to the government protecting our basic rights. So what are we to say about the powers of the government? What powers should it have? Well, Locke says it should have a legislative power. It should be able to make laws. These laws are to be specifications and expansions upon the natural law. So, similar to Thomas Aquinas, he recognizes you'll need some level of human law, some level of application of the natural law. But these laws should not violate our basic rights to life, liberty, and property, and they shouldn't turn the government in a direction of assuming some other end than protecting our life, liberty, and property. He also says that there should be the executive power of government. And here he imagines the execution of the laws in the society. So your police force and somebody in charge of the police force for the state. You know, he's got legislative, executive. What's the last one? Federative. Did you? You guessed judicial, didn't you? <laughs> Not judicial. Locke fills out the federative power of the government, which he thinks of as dealing with the international relations of the country. So the army and the Department of State in our country would fulfill the function of the federative power as Locke thinks of it. So why do we think legislative, executive, and judicial? Well, that actually comes along a little bit later with a guy named Montesquieu. 
who he develops the idea that there should be a separation of powers in the government that actually works out in terms of different offices that are separated from each other. Locke, when he talked about the separation of powers, was just talking about separate jobs that are in the government. He wasn't actually assigning any one of them to a particular role. And if you look at the government in the United States, it's clear that the separation of powers doesn't go exactly with the separation of different offices. Because say the president has a role in legislating. He's the one who signs laws or vetoes them. So he is involved in the legislative power of the government, just as the legislature is involved in the legislative power of the government. Now, this doesn't mean that Locke wouldn't have been interested in having independent judges. As you saw, one of the reasons that we moved from the state of nature into the social contract was because people are biased as judges over their own cases. So no doubt Locke does want a set of independent judges, but Locke thought of judges as part of the executive power of the government because judges are amongst those who execute the law. They hand out sentences to people who have broken the law. So their job in interpreting and applying the law is a part of the executive. So Locke's theory of the separation of powers isn't exactly the same as what we usually think about when we think about the separation of powers. We think more in terms of Montesquieu, but the ways that we separate offices actually work very similarly to how Locke actually thought about them. Locke is actually fairly flexible about the exact shape that government should take. He does uh, have in his mind, though, a kind of picture from England. So he imagines that there's going to be a legislature, and he imagines that that legislature will, in fact, be the dominant power. The legislature is the one who makes the rules, and so everybody else is in some sense below the legislature, because the legislature even makes the rules that the executive must follow. He also holds that in that legislature, a significant part of that legislature must be elected by the people. They must be representatives of the people. He doesn't, however, require that everyone in the legislature be elected by the people, and this fits with English government, where they have two different houses of their legislature. The higher house is the House of Lords, which is appointed by the queen, and they're all members of the nobility. Then the lower house, the House of Commons, is elected by the people. And this reflects, actually, uh, the classical idea of Aristotle, that you might have a kind of mixed government where the nobles uh, were part of it, and so it was partially an aristocracy, and partially the people who were represented by voting, and so you would get the kind of middle class that was in there. And this actually transfers over to the United States, where we maintain that with the Senate, with longer terms of service, who are presumably more able to detach themselves from the populace, the people at home, and they're expected to have higher standards. And then the House of Representatives, which is the more raucous of the houses of the legislature and the one that's more tied to the people because they've got to get reelected every two years. But anyway... Locke also imagined an executive, which for him, probably he thought of a king. Now, uh, a king, you note that he was not a royalist. He was a republican. But by the time we get to Locke and just after Locke, there are reforms happening in England that basically take away the functional power of the king as a legislator. So the two houses take over in making law, and what you have is a constitutional monarchy, where the monarch's fundamental job is carrying out the laws that are given to him by the legislature. So Locke does have that kind of picture in mind and at times hints at it, and no doubt that influences the shape that American democracy eventually takes. But Locke himself was more flexible. He didn't give only one form of government that you could have. Okay, now to the piece de resistance of Locke's political theory, because it's literally a piece about resistance, and that's what that meant in French. <laughs> 
As I said from the beginning, if you want to get to a different conclusion, you have to have a different starting point. He started off differently in the state of nature, and now we can see what that's brought us to. It's brought us to the possibility of revolution. Now, you remember in Hobbes that Hobbes said, well, you know what, the, the king is absolute, and even if the king gets a little bit out of control, uh, we'll have to accept that because nobody wants to go back to the state of nature. Now, Locke made the state of nature a much nicer place. He made it a place where there was kind of uh, civility and people could get along with each other. And you developed money even there, a bit of culture. And you had the natural law that regulated relationships between people. So by the time you get to the end of Locke's theory, you're like, you know what? I could go back to the state of nature. That might not be so bad. So if the government doesn't fulfill its function then we're justified in rising up and overthrowing that government. What could the government do that it wouldn't fulfill its obligations? Well, the legislature could not pass laws that protect our rights or could pass laws that go beyond protecting our rights, that redistribute our wealth and try and be concerned about equality, maybe. That horrible legislature, I mean, if you go along with Locke and the theory of acquisition that he's got, or if the legislature just decided to pull up property from people willy-nilly, that would be unacceptable. It is no longer protecting your individual rights. And even if the legislature does make appropriate rules, but if those rules are not enforced in the society, if we have a lawless society, then the government has failed in its role, and you could rise up and overthrow the government. Or if the government were attacked by another government and failed to protect its citizens, citizens from the outside. It would be failing to protect the lives of its citizens, and we would be free to overthrow the government, maybe except the new government that came in. It depends if they protect our individual rights. Or if the state decided to tax us without giving us representatives in the legislature. How about that? There's one you can write in the history books. This would be a justification for rising up and overthrowing the government. So for Locke, far from Hobbes's world, where you would never want to rise up against the government, he gives you lots of cases in which you might rise up against the government. As a matter of fact, you recognize that some people might think that it was too easy to justify a rebellion against the government. And to this, he said, well, um, maybe there's something to that. But let me tell you that most people, most of the common people, they're not people who are going to make a fuss. They're too lazy to actually bring about a revolution. And so this won't happen unless you get severe violations in these areas. Trust me. Now we can see a little bit of the overlap with Machiavelli. The idea that people are uh, kind of lazy, especially the common people. And maybe this is why the virtue of property went the way that it did in emphasizing industry as we moved into modern society, is trying to rile up those lower classes. Whether that's the kind of virtue we need now, well, that's a continuing question. So Locke laid out a theory, and the people who took him literally were the founding fathers of the United States. From beginning to end, the founding fathers basically plagiarized Locke for every move. I mean, what's the problem that you have? Taxation without representation. i give you a footnote to Locke there. Um, why are you breaking away? Well, let me write a document about how all men are created equal with certain inalienable rights from God. Well, again, footnote Locke, which he doesn't get. I mean, Locke should have been credited as one of the co-writers of the Declaration of Independence, for goodness sake. We give all the credit to Jefferson. But what did Jefferson do? He read Locke. Now, we also know that America is the one place where we took social contract theory so literally that people actually signed a contract. This is known as the Constitution, and it lays out the basic framework for American government. Well, of course, not everybody signed it. It was a group of fairly wealthy white, as a matter of fact, they're fairly bourgeois people, aren't they, that ended up signing that, which raises a whole other set of questions. But Locke's influence on our state goes incredibly far. Although I don't think that, as Americans, we should immediately think that 
what Locke did sets us in. The Founding Fathers, while they were fans of Locke, they made some significant changes to what Locke thought. And you can note that they went with Montesquieu when they were developing the different parts of the government. And there is this weird bit in the Declaration of Independence, where the rights that Locke stated are somewhat different. So it says uh, we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, they didn't change that because they weren't interested in property. You remember that the main justification for the American Revolution had to do exactly with property. So why did they switch that out for the pursuit of happiness? Now, I don't know the exact answer to this in terms of history or biography, but I like to think that the pursuit of happiness makes our rights a little bit more grand than anything that Locke imagined. Because Locke's rights are kind of pedestrian, kind of individualist, and they set us against each other. But maybe if, as Americans, you're called to pursue happiness and that this is one of your rights, maybe this gives us something more positive. Not just things that separate me from others and things that tell other people that I ought to get out of my way, but maybe this means that I ought to be free to join into a particular kind of society that's in front of me. So maybe there's a little bit of classical thought that the Founding Fathers added in and put into Locke. And if that's true, then it explains a lot of society where we today go back and forth between different pictures of society, a kind of more Lockean or more Aristotelian picture of what kind of society we should be. Okay, all of this said, let's go on to put Locke in touch with our particular themes. So, human nature. Humans are rational, sensitive animals. This gives them a conscience. Even though they start off as blank slates, so they're not necessarily good or necessarily bad. All have access to the natural law, even though they might be biased in their own favor in some cases. Social or individual. Humans are individuals with access to the natural law. So while we're individuals, it doesn't mean that we'll immediately start fighting each other or that we'll immediately want things that are diametrically opposed to each other. Society, then, is formed by individuals for the protection of their natural rights. The society comes after the individuals and serves individual rights. People and property. This is the most developed theory of property that we've had so far. People gain private property by mixing their labor and extensions of themselves with natural resources. Early on, there are natural limitations on accumulation, but with the advent of money, these limits are largely eliminated. Individuals may justly accumulate as much as they can, provided there is as much and as good left for others. And it's unclear what you do beyond that, which is where most of us find ourselves, unfortunately. Equality or inequality. Individuals are naturally equal in their inalienable rights to life, liberty, and property, but Locke doesn't say that they're equal in their powers. Human beings might have different powers, and since that's part of themselves, they hold ownership over those powers and everything that those powers produce. The shape of government. A mixed government with legislative, executive, and federative powers. The legislative process should include elected representatives of the people, since it's going to give laws regarding taxation. The purpose of government. Simple. To protect the natural rights of citizens, life, liberty, and property. That's it. That's what the government is supposed to do. What authorizes leadership? The consent of the governed. And here we've come to a fully modern position where the government authority is grounded in the people. Now, Locke was left with serious problems continuing about when exactly did we sign on to this contract? Um, because, as I noted, it was actually just a small number of kind of bourgeois, white, middle-upper-class men who actually signed the paper. And most of us have been born afterwards. 
Locke's answer to that is only relatively better than Hobbes because he says that every time you use a public service, you are signing on to the social contract. So I suppose if you've walked on sidewalks or if you've walked on a public street, that counts as signing on to the social contract for Locke. Although it's not entirely clear that building sidewalks is the kind of thing that Locke's government should be involved in because I'm not sure that that actually protects our life, liberty, and property. So maybe a better example would be if you've ever been protected by police from somebody invading your rights, you have in fact benefited from the society, and so you've signed off on the social contract. And this leaves further questions about, well, what about people who couldn't, like, get out of the country, and so they're forced to enjoy those advantages of their society? Well, tough luck, I guess. No way around it. We've come all the way to a modern politics based in the people, based in the equality of everyone, except for, you know, not women and not black people, and as I've noted, and the poor kind of get screwed a lot. So can we extend that? Well, we're going to see that next time with our readings from early advocates of women's rights and rights for blacks. So we'll come back to that in the next lecture.